The Wench is Dead by Colin Dexter. The 1989 winner of the Crime Writers Association Gold Dagger Award for Crime Novel of the Year. Dramatized for radio by Guy Meredith, with John Shrapnel as Inspector Morse and Robert Glanister as Sergeant Lewis. Can you hear me? Oh. What day is it, Lewis? Oh, God. Oh. Look, get him on a stretcher and down the rack. Right. Quick. No, wait, wait. Come on, that's quickly. Wait a minute. Wait. Come on, come on. Come on. Oh, 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 Quite lucky, really. Lucky. Postman heard you, apparently, and looked through the letterbox. Morse, Mr. E. Yes. A few questions if you're up to it, Mr. Morse. Uh, kidney bowl there in case you... Look what's happened to me. Well, you wouldn't have to be Sherlock Holmes to diagnose some fairly radical tummy trouble. Oh. Uh, heavy drinker, are you? Certainly not. How many pints a week, would you say? A week. I see. And spirits? A drop of scotch. So... A bottle would last you... Depends on the size of the bottle. Look, what is the matter with me? Well, the consultant will make the final diagnosis, of course, but I can certainly feel the <coughs> liver enlarged, and you've obviously had a stomach hemorrhage, which at best means an ulcer that suddenly decided to bleed. Well, at worst... I'm sorry, I'm... <coughs> oh, oh, dear. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, Porter! Keep an eye on him, and any change will ship him into intensive care. Just as you say, Doctor. He'll be in 7C for now. I can't quite make it out. Concentrate, girl. It seems to be only every 30 seconds. Should I call the doctor? Leave him be. If my ministering isn't good enough... <laughs> wanting is it cheap oh, what no just the bottle then yeah in the locker uh, don't unhook yourself oh. we're all dripped up here what what time is it 4 20 a.m by the clock oh, God. they carried you in around nine but i know how it is you're halfway to the next world the first day or so other way round. I can manage, thank you. Lucky to get a bed, mind Ooh. you, the way things are. If they hadn't Ooh. wheeled the colonel out. <laughs> Dead men's shoes, it used to be. <laughs> Dead men's sheets now, eh? <laughs> they changed them, of course. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, look, what do I... Oh, um... On the table. 
They collect it. Waggy green away, by the way. Oh. Perforated ulcer. You? I'm not sure. <laughs> Under the knife tomorrow. Wonderful here, though, the staff. <sighs> Something about a hospital. Takes your cares away, doesn't it? <sighs> I sell insurance outside, and I'll tell you straight. It's the pressure put me in here. Look, if you don't mind, I'm tired. I'm now, you... I'm a good judge of faces. I'd say your line was... Hey, hey, don't tell me. I can guess. Sir Jomford Chambers. Chamber. Pots. <laughs> Ministering Angel. Here's a clue there. <sighs> Inspector Morse. After a lengthy career marked by ingenuity of... Uh, clue. Not overdue. Think of the clue. Five, two, five. Solve that, Morse. One of the few members of the constabulary to be a quarter finalist in the Times Grassword. <laughs> no, solve it. Respected rather than well liked by his colleagues at the Oxford. No glad fate. He contrived. Yes, that's more like it. <laughs> Was unmarried and leaves no surviving relatives. Five, two, five. Angel of death. What? No, it's not fair. I've solved it. I can't. I won't go! You're looking better this morning, Mr. Morse. Oh, must be the daylight. Terrible dreams. Well, that could be the medication. You get used to it. Orange one first, then the white. Mm. Now, what excitement have we got in store for you? Oh, an endoscopy. <coughs> <laughs> Don't worry, it's painless. It's the injection I give you in the bottom first that hurts. Why is being ill so undignified? Mm. And who said hospital takes your cares away? Is there really a man called Waggy Greenaway? Next bed, except he's in theatre this morning. We shall have to take care of you if you're not to go the same way. Mm. Oh, looks like you've got a visitor. I'll see you later. Huh? Oh, Lewis. How did you find me? Well, in the first place, I'm a detective, sir. And the second I came in with you, don't you remember? Oh, the last thing I recall is listening to Votan's farewell on the record player, feeling a tremendous pain down below and trying to make it to the toilet. And what do they say is the trouble? Being held pending charges. But it seems they're not too happy with my alcohol intake. Oh. Oh, in that case... Uh, what have you got in the bag, Lewis? Well, nothing. Well, a bottle of lemon barley water. The missus thought it might cheer you up. Well, that's very kind of her. You tell her I'd rather have that than a whole crate of whiskey. Really, sir? No, but pass on the message. What else? Book. It's been knocking around the house a bit, and I thought you might... The Age of Steam. Hmm. The Victorians and their railways. Well, if I had a coffee table, Liz, it would have pride of place. Anything else? Well, we did have a quick whip round the lads in CID. And... What's this? What? Lemon barley water. There are regulations in this hospital as to what visitors may and may not bring in. You'll find a copy of them posted outside the ward. Your friend here is still very poorly, and whatever you in your wisdom think may do him good may not. I shall remove this bottle, and if you're minded to bring in any other little gifts, please report them to me first. Who was that? Sister McLean. 
Seems to be a sort of Calvinistic saturate. Well, doesn't have to be quite so sharp, though, does she? Ah, forget it, Lewis. Probably disappointed in her love life or something. What else is in the bag? I think, under the circumstances... Look, Lewis, my stomach may be out of order, but there is nothing wrong with my brain. If the lads at the station had a whip round... Well, sir, um, not until it's official. If I just pass it under the bedclothes... <sighs> now, this wouldn't be bells, would it? It would, sir. Well, I shall dwell on the prospect with pleasure, Lewis. Here, in the locker, before it's spotted... Well, seems to be the end of visiting time. Yes. Good of you to come in, you know. Well, it's nice to see you, sir. Don't mind saying you gave me a fright yesterday. We're all looking forward to having you back at the station. Really? Have I had a sudden access of popularity? Well... Look, was that bottle the result of a whip round, or did you buy it yourself? Well, the truth is, sir, I didn't have a chance to get round to the others. But the superintendent did yes, say... Yes, I bet he did. The sooner I can get back, the better, is that it? Well, you ask him from me, Lewis, if he's ever thought about dying. Would that be a suggestion, sir? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. I'm losing my sense of humour. I never could stand hospitals, even visiting. Look, um... I'd, I'd be happy to see you again. Whenever you can make it. Wedding anniversary tomorrow, but Wednesday, I promise. Spirits up, sir, as it were. Spirits up. But for how long? They never tell you anything. Oh, oh bloody medication. What is it? They never tell you a bloody thing. Look at that, Lewis. Best pint this side of Banbury. Clear as a bell. A head like Atlantic Breakers. It's a shame to drink it. Almost. Mmm. Ooh, that's beautiful. How's your St. Clements? Just the thing if you're driving, sir. Will we be... What, staying here long? Well, I would have thought another one, wouldn't you? Sharpens the cerebral processes. Take it in moderation. Can't do you any harm. So... If we consider the external appearance of the patient, we can make certain observations. Middle-aged, yes. Could happily lose a couple of stone, without doubt. Right, let's get on to the results of the endoscopy. Can any of you budding surgeons tell me what they signify? <coughs> In the answer, no reply. Shall we try something a little simpler? Does anybody know what an endoscopy is? It's from the Greek. End on within, scopane to examine. Very good, Mr. Morse. Thank you. I didn't realise we had a scholar amongst us. Well, from the way you were talking, I don't think you realised you had a person amongst you. All right, class dismissed. I'm sure you have other duties to attend to. I shall have a word with Mr. Morse at hominem. Hmm. <clears throat> Mind if I sit down, Mr. Morse? Go ahead. Still painful, is it, the old gut? Look, if you're here to bully me... That's exactly what I'm here to do, Mr. Morse. You have a perforated ulcer. I could operate on it, but I'm not sure I should waste precious NHS funds. What do you say to that? Uh, I don't think NHS funds should be limited. Good answer. And as it happens, I also believe your answer can be tamed by less extreme methods. For instance, a more cautious and restrictive diet over the months and years ahead. You are whatever evasive answers you care to make, a heavy drinker. Is that the result of the endoscopy? No, it is a result of years of experience observing this country's professional classes. Well, I'm not sure I'd include myself. And of course, this is only the beginning. Should you care to continue, I've no doubt diabetes waits around the corner. Then after diabetes, of course, we have our old friend cirrhosis of the liver. Look, I don't mind being given the facts, but I do object to the high and mighty tone. Don't let it run away with you, Mr. Morse. We are all more or less partial, but keep it under control. I thought I was. Did you? Then why do you have a bottle of scotch in your locker? A bottle... How did you know? A scrap of blue tissue paper on the floor. Oh. Elementary. Uh, by the way, word of warning. If you really can't hang on until you leave here, at least wait till Sister McLean's off duty. Why would she skin me alive? Possibly, but it's not you I'm thinking of. It's the danger to the bottle. I'm sorry? I shall be around again, Mr. Morse. No, uh, wait a minute. You haven't told me how long I'm going to be in hospital. We're as keen to throw you out as you are to go. All a question of progress. Keep the brain lively. That's my advice. Mensana incorpore statico.
Now, just one more to go. Six letters. Bradman's famous duck. <laughs> Donald. Oh, that's very nice. That's it till tomorrow. Now, what is this soup? Oxtail. Eh? Oxtail soup. Oh, God. <laughs> Delicious, isn't it? Never used to like it, but when you've been on the old nil by mouth... I'm sorry, yes, I should have asked you. How are you feeling? Oh, never better. Nothing like a brush with a scalpel to sharpen your appetite for life. <laughs> they say I'll be able to catch up with the East Enders next week. All worth it then, really, wasn't it? Have a little gloat on the nurses in the meantime. That Fiona's a cracker, isn't she? Is that her name? Yeah, she seems a nice girl. Still... I'm a happily married man. Nothing like the consolations of a family, eh? Daughters coming in this evening. Can't always get away. Work shifts in the Boglium. She's a librarian. Uh, done very well for herself. Not the books are exactly my thing, but the statistics she could give you at that place make mm. your mind boggle. Well, I remember that when it next needs boggling. Now, if you'll excuse me, I think the archers yeah, the are just about to... Now. He was a book man as well. Not just reading, either. Writing. As a hobby, you know. Uh, plug the headphones in first. Oh. Uh, gave me a copy of one before it popped off. Can't say I've managed more on the first page or so, but... It's all bloody pop music. Channel six, you want. Mm. Look, I wouldn't care to have a glance at it, would you? Mm. Colonel's book. I feel I owe it to the old boy's memory that someone ought to read it. No, Not very long, and if you're the literary type. Well, yes, yes, thanks, thanks. I'll uh, flick through it later. If it's any better than the age of steam. Of the Summertown Parish Churchyard, only a few headstones are adequately preserved, and those from the second and third quarters of the 19th century. But it is one such which provides the starting point for this short dissertation, which I trust will be of interest to other local historians. The epitaph itself is brief but poignant. It reads, To the memory of Joanna Franks, wife of Charles Franks, who, having been primitively and cruelly assaulted, was found most tragically drowned in the Oxford Canal on June the 22nd, 1859, aged 38 years. Behind these words, there lies a tale of a helpless young woman who found herself at the mercy of coarse and most brutally uninhibited boatmen during an horrendous journey, whose details provide the subject for the following narrative. Well, all being well, I'll catch up with East Enders next week. So long as you're not sizing up life assurance prospects in the TV lounge. <laughs> this is one place I wouldn't try and start working. Anyway, listen, before you go, there was someone I want you to meet. Uh, Mr. Morse. Mr. Morse? Mm hmm. My daughter, Christine. Hello. Remember I said top dog at the Bodleian? Oh, Dad. Senior librarian, lower reading room. Really? Well, when I was there, the librarians oh, were... Oh, you were at the university, Mr. Morse? Yes, and the librarians were certainly... Older, I bet. <laughs> Told her she'd done well for herself. <laughs> Come along, please. I must be going. Nice to have met you, Mr. Morse. And you, Miss Greenaway. And you, Dad. Remember that convalescence is the part that makes illness worthwhile. Oh. <laughs> you take it easy. Bye-bye. <laughs> Lovely girl, isn't she? Sure. Uh, George Bernard, that is. I mean, the quote from, about convalescence. Oh. Uh, right. Yeah. How are you getting on with the Colonel's book, then? It's fascinating. Well, no need to be polite. It's because the old boy's pushed off. Tell you the truth, I didn't even open it. Well, you should have, Waggy. It's riveting stuff. Joanna Franks hailed originally from Derby, the only daughter of a reasonably prosperous home, where her father was an agent for the local friendly society. Whether she had a rebellious streak or not, we can't tell but she seems to have broken with middle-class expectations in her first marriage to one F.T. Donovan, an Irishman from County Meath, 
who appeared in many theatres and music halls, both in London and the provinces. He was a conjurer by profession, and one of his handbills describing him as emperor of all the illusionists still survives. See Appendix 1. However, the stage is a fickle mistress, and no appearances are traceable for the last year of his life, 1858. He died that autumn, a childless and no doubt embittered man, whilst on holiday with a friend in Ireland, where he was buried in the cemetery overlooking Burtnaboy Bay. It was a year or so later that Joanna met and fell deeply in love with her second husband, one Charles Franks, an ostler from Liverpool. And what do you think you're doing? Uh, me? I, I was just... Lights go out at ten o'clock. You're disturbing everyone on the ward. Look, they're all asleep. What's this you're reading? Murder on the Oxford Canal. Some lurid fantasy, no doubt. Uh, hardly. It's an historical investigation undertaken by the previous occupant of this bed, who departed feet first despite the finest ministering. That, Mr. Morse, is a very underhand remark. Colonel Denniston was carried off by advanced septicemia, and we were all very sorry to see him go. Lights off. Look, look. Perhaps you're right. I shouldn't have. Good night, Mr. Morse. Oh. Morse, Morse, Morse. What is it with you and women? When are you ever going to get it right? Like her first, Joanna's second marriage appears to have been a happy one, in spite of the fact that times were still hard and money still scarce. She found employment as a dressmaker and designer's model in Liverpool, but Franks himself was less successful, and finally decided to try his luck in London. He was almost immediately engaged as an ostler at the George and Dragon Inn on the Edgware Road, and in May of 1859, he sent his wife a guinea and begged her to join him. Morning, Jack. It was on Saturday, June the 11th, that the petite and attractive figure of Joanna Franks bought her ticket for the narrowboat Barbara Bray, the sole fare-paying passenger, en route for the capital. Mr. Morse, your morning check-up. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I was quite engrossed. Wish I had time to read. You're not working day and night. Hmm, sometimes seems like it. And then at home. But don't tell me you've got a family. You're too young for that. Anyway, you're not married. No ring, you mean? Mm. Is that what you're trained to spot in the police? Temperature? Well, I... I'm... Appearances can be deceptive, Mr Morse. Mm -hmm. I should have thought a detective would know that. Besides which, what you need to concentrate on is getting better. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to... Oh, nodded through customs anyway. Customs? Mm, that's Sister McLean. One get well card from his secretary, one tube of mint flavoured toothpaste from the missus, both undeclared. Mm. Set your stamp on the ward, have you, sir? Well, I wouldn't say that, but I did have words with Sister last night. Hurts to admit it, but I think I was in the wrong. Good Lord, sir. Hospital life has made its mark on you. Less sarcasm, please, Lewis. I'm an invalid, remember? Is there anything I can bring you from the outside world next time I come? Well, there is, as a matter of fact, Lewis. A map of the British Isles. A map of the British Isles, sir? Yeah, the outside world in miniature. Oh, and if you've got a spare moment, you might find an address for me. Colonel Denniston, or widow of same. No hurry. Next time you're in, we'll be fine. The captain of the Barbara Bray was a certain Jack Oldfield from Coventry. According to later testimony, a basically good-natured sort of fellow, though of a blunt, blustery type of address. The fellow members of the crew were Alfred Musson and a teenage lad, Thomas Wooten. The facts of the journey, which was to prove so tragic for Joanna Franks, can be reconstructed from Canal Company registers and, importantly, from evidence given at the subsequent trial at Oxford Assizes. We may imagine, for instance, the embarkation. There you go. I've never been on a boat before, oh. not outside the rowing lake at Sefton Park. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get used to it. Not often we take passengers, neither. Uh, these are your quarters. Oh. Cramped, I know, but uh, we're full up with cargo. What's you carrying? Spirit. 
whiskey. Oh. Come along with those travelling boxes, boy. Here you are, miss. Where shall I store them? Oh, wherever they fit, I should think. Here's a penny for you. I'm afraid I can't be more generous. I hope I shall have enough for eating along the way. Well, the sidings is cheap normally, if you sup with us. Apart from that, you'll be left alone. But so far as possible on a boat this size. Oh, well, I'm prepared to be sociable, if we are to be together for the best part of a week. <laughs> Ready to cast off, Mr. Oldfield! Uh, go ahead then, Musson, and prod that horse. We'll need to make pace if we're to reach Hawkesbury Junction by Monday night. Yeah. But reach it they did. Progress to Hawkesbury, where the Coventry joined with the Oxford Canal, must have been smooth and the atmosphere on board amicable, for it soon became known that Oldfield had sat with Joanna in the cabin while the boat was negotiated through the Northwich and Harecastle tunnels. However, from the time the Barbara Bray reached the lonely locks of Napton Junction, with Oxford still some fifty miles distant, the story changes dramatically. What exactly, we must ask, took place on that last fatal stretch to the triangular basin of Duke's Cut, from which Joanna's body was shortly to be hauled? So, up, out. Hmm? Tests. What, already? Already, Mr. Morse. Like Caesar's army on the march, recovery is arriving sooner than anyone expected. Not total recovery, surely. I can still feel... Of course you can still feel, Mr. Morse, symptom of age. Aches and pains bound to multiply. Not unwilling to leave us, are you? Uh, no, but I... Don't you worry, you're still a wheelchair coach. Won't be discharged till you're walking wounded. Nurse, unhook the drip, would you? And Porter, first stop radiography. Oh, God. I'd bring your book with you if I were you, Morse. There'd be plenty of waiting around. But let us leave that fateful journey for the moment and turn to the trial. There were three indictments against the men. The willful murder of Joanna Franks by throwing her into the canal, rape upon the said woman, and the stealing of various articles. Wooten the boy was not named in the final indictment, and Musson and Oldfield pleaded not guilty to the charges, of which that of rape was soon dropped for lack of evidence. Nonetheless, the obvious brutality of Joanna's death attracted a hostile crowd to the courtroom. Your name again, please? Uh, William Stevens, canal clerk, sir. And repeat your evidence. Uh, it was uh, Tuesday, 21st of June, about 11 a.m., when the Barbara Bray reached Napton Locks. The boat remained there about an hour and a half. There was a woman passenger on board. She seemed most aggrieved. The conduct of these men, with whom I am driven to associate, has been utterly disgraceful. What am I to do? And did you log this complaint? Uh, I should have done, I agree, sir. Instead, I advised the lady that she should report to the company offices upon reaching Oxford where she might switch to another boat for the last leg of her journey. Which she was never, alas, to make. And that was the last you saw of her? Saw, yes, for she went below. From there, though, I heard an altercation with one of the crew members. Leave me alone! I have nothing to do with you! And I could not make out the reply, though it was clear that the two seniors of the crew were much the worse for drink. Those being the two defendants whom we see arraigned before us. To entrust a cargo of whiskey to men of such low character seems to me the height of folly. It appears, in fact, that Stephen's advice did not go unheeded. At Banbury, some twelve miles further down the canal, Joanna made a determined effort to seek alternative transport. Matthew Lawrenson, Warfinger at Tooley's Yard. And what time did you see Joanna Franks? At about 6.30pm that same day. She made urgent inquiries to me about the times of immediate coaches to London and from Oxford to Banbury. Oxford to Banbury? But she is in Banbury. Uh, yes, sir. Seems strange, but then her general appearance was somewhat flushed and afeared. 
It may be that she'd had a drink. I couldn't say for sure. And Musson and Oldfield? Oh, they were well away, the pair of them. They hadn't stopped the boat. Miss Franks had simply jumped off, the way ladies sometimes do for matters of toilet. She could easily catch it up again. And in fact, she did? Yes, sir. Weren't no immediate coaches to London this side of Oxford. So what could she do but carry on? As indeed the unfortunate girl did. The next witness was the landlord of the Crown and Castle, some miles below Banbury, where the Barbara Bray arrived at about ten o'clock that night. She hurried in and confessed she was so frightened of the lecherous drunkards on board that she was determined to walk the towpath and take her chances with the footpad and cup purses. And what was your reply? You know, I offered her a glass of stout for her composure, but she declined it. Then in came Oldfield and Musson, drunk as lords. <laughs> <laughs> Begging your pardon, my lord. And? Joanna Franks went and sat by the edge of the canal, sharpening a knife on the side of the lock, for her defence, I imagine, for Oldfield was yelling, Ooh, I'll have my way with her this night, or see an end to the woman. While Musson, as he turned out to be, was equally belligerent. Curse her eyes and damn it to hell's flames! for I loathe and detest the very sight of her. They was neither of them friends of the other. I'll say that as well. I see. And did Joanna Franks proceed on foot along the towpath? She did not, sir. Nor did she lodge the night at the inn, which she could have easily done as we had room. There seemed to be some sort of reconciliation, you might say, for she reboarded the boat, and I remember seeing her being offered a drink, which I think she, I think she took. Well, that cannot be since the post-mortem showed no alcohol whatever in her body. Possibly so, sir. Possibly so. And then, finally, the most grotesque scene of all. My husband, who is the keeper of Somerton Deep Lock, was fast asleep. But I heard the screams. Terrified they were. I went to the window and saw two men by the edge of the boat and a woman seated on top of the cabin with her legs hanging over the side. Put it down. Not go down. Do not attempt me. Find a leg. Find a leg. What have you done with my shoes? Oh, please tell me. What's going on down there? Help. Nothing. A passenger. Don't worry. She's having words with her husband inside. Her husband inside. That's it. That lock house was Joanna's last hope of safety, yet she ignored it. No one, apart from the evil boatman of the Barbara Bray, was to see her alive again. Lights out. It's not right. Lights out, Mr Greenaway. Mr Morse. Orders is orders. How do you feel after your run around the hospital, Morse? Like a trolley full of supermarket groceries when it reaches the checkout. <laughs> uh, good night, Morse. Good night, Waggy. It's not right. Won't do. Too many questions. All right. Enumerate. One. Good nature of Captain Oldfield. What happened to it? Well... Everyone changes after they've had a drink. All right, two. Why didn't Joanna take the train from Liverpool to London? Answer, shortage of funds. But how much more expensive was it? Well, that can be checked. Three, general point. Was it a fair trial? Well, boatmen hardly the pinnacle of society, public against them from the word go. Did that influence justice? Well, I'm not sure. Fill that one in later. Four. Key to the whole puzzle. Why Joanna's continued presence on the boat? Could it be? No, don't pencil anything in yet. Two chapters of the book still to go. Anything else? Yeah. Five. Had she or had she not had a drink? Is it important? Imagine a whole barge load of whiskey. Ooh, temptation. 
Well, there's a single bottle in the cupboard. I shouldn't, but uh, sharpens the cerebral processes. Glass sitting handy. Sister not around. Go on then, Morse. Oh, oh, careful. Stealth the watchword. Now. Oh, liquid gold. It's a shame to drink it. Almost. Oh, almost feel the brain cells going into action. Marvellous, Lewis. Sir? You'll miss it. Marvellous. Almost prescient. I see, sir. I'd never actually thought of her in that way. Yeah, the age of steam. Turned out to be just what I needed. Well, part of what I needed, anyway. Really, sir? I'm not quite sure. Look, look, it's right here. Third class rail fare, Liverpool to London, 19 shillings and sixpence. Mm -hmm, yes. She could have afforded it. Who could, sir? Joanna Franks. She was sent to Guinea. She could have afforded it. Yes, sir. What sort of drugs have they got you on here, sir? I'm sorry, Lewis? Well, you seem to be jumping around a bit. Are you feeling all right? I'm feeling much better, Lewis, much better. Something to occupy the mind, that's it. No, then, was I expecting you today? Oh, no, sir, but there's another crash victim from the A34 in intensive care, and I thought, as I picked up a map of the British Isles, I'd uh, take the opportunity that's to... That's most kind, Lewis. Most kind, I'd almost forgotten that. Oh, Lewis. Hmm? Now, you see that woman by the next bed? Oh, yes, sir. What do you make of her? Oh, uh, early 30s, attractive. Difficult to tell sitting down, but she's probably five foot. She's a librarian, Lewis. Would you credit it? Well, I don't know. But the bodily. Huge repository of information. And I need a word with her. <laughs> I see, sir. Would you like me to serve a warrant? A well, tap on the shoulder should do fine. I would have thought, Sergeant. Quite, sir. I suppose you couldn't get it's out of... It's difficult to get out of bed, Lewis. Yes. It's very hard work. Right, sir, of course. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, this Colonel Deniston fellow. I Colonel can wait. The Colonel is waiting eternally, but I must speak to that woman before the end of visiting time. Very well, sir. <laughs> then if you'll excuse me... That's what I'm trying to do, Lewis. Go on. <clears throat> Uh, the map of the British Isles. What's that for? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Ireland. Now, let's see. Hello. Ah, oh, Miss Greenaway. Look, uh, sorry to drag you away from your father, but... Yes? I was wondering, it's a bit of a cheat not knowing you, but... Given that you um, work in the Bodleian, I was... You'd like me to look something up for you? <laughs> How'd you guess? It's what all the men ask me. Oh. Well, <laughs> it is actually very impertinent, I know, but uh, probably very busy, but... Uh... I am, but I'm busy being a librarian, <laughs> which includes helping people find information. Now, what is it you want? Well, I'm afraid it's rather vague, but... Um... Yes? Um. Uh, what is it? Mr. Uh, Morse? Nurse, sister! No, 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 it's all right, please. It's all right, don't... don't. What, what's the matter? Where's the pain? Oh, it's in my stomach. Something I drank last night. I shouldn't have done. Drank? You're sweating. No, no. There. It's gone. It's passed. But what, what was it? It's my own fault. It's the wages of sin. Now, what was I saying? You were vague about the information you needed. Look, are you quite I'm fine, sure... I'm fine, yes. Yes, it's, um... Well, it's to do with coach timetables in the mid-19th century. Hello? Uh, excuse me? Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, do you need a lift anywhere? Uh, thanks, but I've got my car over here. Right. Uh, look, I'm sorry for dragging you away from your father. It's just that the inspector can be a bit, um... Well, what's the word? Um, imperious? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Even when he's off duty. And you don't get much more off duty than this, do you? He doesn't look like a policeman somehow. And what do policemen look like? No, no, don't say it like me, I know. <laughs> did he, um... Did he ask you a favour? 
wants me to do some research for him. Right. Well, I know it's a bit of a cheek. That's what he said. But you'll do it, will you? I mean, I don't know what he's got his teeth into, but it means a lot to him, keeping his brain going. If you think of it as a favour... I'll think of it as a pleasure. I rather like the look of your Inspector Morse. This bird here. Who is he? Mr. Morse. Are you still awake? Well, I don't normally sleep that much. Well, you should do. Rest and recuperation are what you need. What medication are you on? White, orange and difficult to swallow. Look, the other night I was a bit hasty. Mm, I, I think this dosage could be altered. I'll have a word. What I mean is, you are obviously very dedicated. Thirty years in the profession. Difficult to think of anything else. And the deaths? Do you ever get used to them? Do you? <laughs> I only ever see corpses and that as little as I can help it. But my involvement with death is mainly cerebral. Puzzling about it. If it's your own you're worrying about. Oh, no, no, I've got over there. No next of kin. No dependents. No, just at the moment, it's someone who died a century and a half ago that I've got on the brain. You, Mr. Morse, need some sleep. Yes, you're probably right, sister. But it's as you say. Thirty years in the profession. Sometimes it's difficult to think of anything else. Take the boat hook. Here, here, this way. Right, I got her. Got her. I just. Oh my God. What? The face. Hey. Look at the face. Joanna's body was found by two local fishermen, floating alongside the bank, head north, east, south. Her face, for some strange reason, had turned quite black. And tell me, Mr. Oldfield, when you found that Joanna Franks was, as you put it, missing, what, as captain of the boat, did you do? I woke up mustn't. I wanted to know what he'd done with her. What he'd done with her? Must have been him. It wasn't me. Well, you're prepared to admit that one of you murdered her. That at least is a start. She'd been a trial the whole journey. She was a wicked woman. Wicked? Because... Wicked how, Mr. Oldfield? Do I see your wife in the gallery? Aye. Eh? Is there something you're afraid of admitting? Wicked? Because she hadn't the strength to resist when you forced your sexual attentions on her? Is that it, Mr. Oldfield? And then, when you realized the evilness of the act you'd perpetrated, perhaps more than once, you decided, in a drunken stupor, to do away with her. Isn't that it, Mr. No. Oldfield? No, no, it isn't. I never killed her! I never! And then what happened, Musson? according to your version. Well, when the boy said she'd been gone for a couple of hours, we went looking for her, along the bank. Along the bank? In the dark, that would be. It can be a dangerous place. We were agitated. You were agitated, and it can be a dangerous place. Never were truer words spoken. And did anybody see the two of you during your nocturnal perambulation along the canal bank? There was someone, yes. A man passed us, and around four it was, and we asked him had he seen a woman walk in. And his reply was? Well, he made no reply, simply shook his head and passed on. A phantom of the night, it appears, just as this whole search for Joanna Franks was a sham. A sham, Musson, because you had already killed her. No! Either you alone, as Mr. Oldfield maintains, or the two of you together. You had killed her, either by blows or by holding her head under the water as she writhed in agony and then dumped her body without a hint of remorse in the canal. No! You're the third member of the crew, is that correct? Yes, sir. It is, sir. 
And tell me, Wooden, Thomas, what you remember of that night? I've been at the tiller, sir, most of the time, and negotiating the locks alone. And why was such an arduous duty delegated to a young lad like yourself? Oh, because the other two were a good half-seas over, sir. <laughs> that much is concurred upon by all. And when you were at the tiller, Thomas, could you hear what was going on in the rest of the boat? Well, it depends how loud it was, sir. Uh, could you, for instance, and I apologise to the court for asking this question of one of such tender years, uh, could you hear love-making going on? Depends how loud it was, sir. <laughs> Let me be more direct. Did you hear sexual activity that very night? I did, sir. Shortly after we'd left Summit and Deep Lock. I see. And was the aggressor in that activity Oldfield, or was it Musson? Well, that I couldn't say, sir. Very well. And after this unspecific activity, what happened? Um, well, Miss Franks came on deck, sir, and said she would walk the towpath were it all the way to Oxford. Did she? Hmm. And she never afterwards returned to the boat? Not that I saw, sir, no. Th th though, though it would be possible to slip aboard again in the dark. A possible to slip aboard or possible to slip off. Isn't that right? Well, I suppose. Because that is the final piece in the jigsaw. After Joanna left the boat, Oldfield or Musson or both secretly followed her, did away with the poor woman and then returned to feign sleep until they were awoken by this weary lad some two hours later, at which point they shamelessly expressed agitation that their passenger was missing and went off pretending to look for her. Mr. Samuels, you conducted the post-mortem on Joanna Franks. I did, sir. And could you, sir, give the court an estimate of the time of her death? Not easy, sir, in a body which has lain in the water. Sometime that previous night, certainly, and from the discoloration of the face earlier rather than later. And the cause of death? Again, difficult to say. Some bruising on the face may have been caused by blows, by incidents in the water after death, or by holding the woman tightly from behind. On the whole, sir, I think the most likely cause was forcible drowning. Forcible drowning? And can you tell me, sir, how the body was dressed when retrieved from the water? To the best of my knowledge, it was fully clothed, apart from bonnet and shoes. And there were no other signs of violence? There was one. The calico undergarment which the woman was wearing had been ripped widely across the front. And we have the very garment. Is this not it, sir? It is. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And there was one final witness whose pathetic appearance drove home the horror of what had happened, who evoked the greatest feeling and the widest sympathy. This was Charles Franks, the husband of the dead woman. I'm sorry, I cannot bear it. To be under the same roof as her murderers. I cannot bear to look at them. We will be brief, Mr. Franks. You must simply confirm to the court that you identified your wife's body. Her face was awful. But was there not a mark? There was a birthmark behind her left ear. And this was on the corpse? It was, sir. It was. <laughs> and if any other corroboration were needed, the poor woman's shoes, later found in Joanna's cabin on the Barbara Bray, matched in the minutest degree the contours of her feet. At the conclusion of the hearing, after a lengthy summing up, the jury retired to consider their verdict. Three days, sir. I mean, I mean, sorry. You've come up for report, and that's the decision. Three days, and you're out. Normal meals from here on, half rations of medication, and try the odd walk around the corridor for exercise. Sister McLean tells me you're all but a well man. Does she? And Sister McLean is a real expert, believe me. 
Seems to think you're a fundamentally strong type, and apart from the kidneys and your liver and your stomach, I'm inclined to agree. You may well last till 60 if you kept down on the booze. Been at the cupboard yet? Uh, well... Thought as much. If you're back in here again, I'll cut half your innards away. Bear that in mind. Back to your book, then. Uh, yes. Thank you. Chapter 3, Note 1. The man who passed Oldfield and Musson on the canal bank around 4 a.m. may well have been a vital witness in substantiating their claims. Someone roughly answering their description of him, one Donald Favant, had signed the register at the Nag's Head in Oxford on the 20th of June. But this man, despite widespread appeals, never came forward. Interesting. Been uh, given the all clear, then? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, more or less. <laughs> Find home a bit quiet after this, I dare say. Mm. Nothing like the ward for a laugh and a chat, is there? <laughs> yeah. I like a joke myself, and that's why I'm called Waggy, you see. Mm -hmm. Walter's a real name. <laughs> Not disturbing you, am I? Yes, but while I'm disturbed, let me ask you a question. What's a friendly society, Waggy? Ah, now you've got the right man there. The, the friendly societies were the forerunners of your present-day insurance companies. Hmm? Everyone got together to pay in a certain amount which they could later draw on if they were sick or retired. Next question. Where can I find some peace around here? Oh. Well, you could try the library. That's always empty. Hospital has a library? Floor below, far end of the corridor. Hmm. Colonel used to like it there when he could get up and around. Did he? Then that could be my first little adventure. A daughter'll be in again today. Mm -hmm. So you were starting to get on. Books, you see. Be wanting to see her again, will you? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes, if I'm not back... I'll send her down. Don't you worry. Silence. Long time since I've heard that. Now, let's see. Collected works of Georgette Heyer, Robert Ludlum, ad lib. Well, ad librium. What did the Colonel want here? Uh, same as me, no doubt. Tranquility for the questioning mind. But in his case, not quite questioning enough, was it, Colonel? Mm hmm? Too many prejudgments. Nice bit of research work, granted, on the trial documents and so on, but you've got to stand back. Take the synoptic view. Synoptic? Overall. Was there a miscarriage of justice? That's the question. Presumption of innocence seems to have given way to assumption of guilt. Crowds baying for blood. What's a couple more bargees or less in this world? You haven't finished the book yet. <laughs> I know, and I'm going to. But there are too many explanations lacking. Such as? Well, the sex for a start. Was it a question of rape or wasn't it? Love-making is hardly the way you refer to a sexual assault. And why was the charge dropped? Lack of evidence, I told you. Lack of evidence or lack of conviction? How do we know? How do we know Joanna Franks wasn't leading those men on? Uh, that's a very unfashionable remark. I'm the old buffer here. All right, but it at least provides an explanation for why they're alternately damning and blasting her and then affecting reconciliations. Now, how would you feel on a long journey prompted by a drink if a woman seemed half the time to be offering herself and the rest of the I time... I am dead, Morse. Fair enough, but I know how I'd feel. And what about the charge of theft? That seems to have quietly slipped away, doesn't it? If she didn't have two pennies to rub together, as she maintained, why was there even a suspicion of theft in the first place? What was in those two travelling boxes she'd brought on board? Uh, if I knew... The shoes. What's all this about the shoes? She stride off down the canal bank without them? Oh, too many questions, Morse. That's what I said. Then let me ask you one. If the boatman didn't murder Joanna Franks, who did? I was a mere researcher. You're a policeman. You should be able to work it out. I know, I know, but I need evidence. Mr. Morse? Oh, hello. Are you... Oh, I thought I heard... Oh, I was talking to myself. <laughs> Bad habit. Did your father... Said you'd be down here, yeah. yes. That's quite a contrast to the Bodleian, isn't it? <laughs> uh, that information you wanted... Uh, you found it? 
Yes, here. Uh, from the book, Victorian Banbury. By about 1850, coach routes from Banbury to London had been more or less abandoned. Ah, so that much is true. However, coaches as far as Oxford were plentiful as a result of the rail link between that city and London. And coaches back from Oxford as well, presumably. Uh, yes. I have it here. Mm. A total of 12 coaches made the return journey through the day and late into the night. So she could have escaped at least as far as Oxford, while at the same time... I'm sorry? No, 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 I'm sorry. Carry on, please. Well, uh, that's about it. Uh, from Oxford, you had the choice of the train, or for the poorer classes, another coach which for five shillings deposited you in the Edgware Road. Edgware Road? Somewhere near Marble Arch, I imagine. Is that... That is marvellous. That really is. You've been very kind. Look, I suppose I should explain. Why you need the information? Mm. No one in a library ever does. And I'm happy to have been of help. You seem a lot more thoughtful than the usual brand of student we get. Really? You're probably just older, that's all. Not so old. Not old enough to be my father, for instance. Uh, talking of whom, I'd probably better get back upstairs. Uh, you have a visitor waiting as well. Your sergeant. Oh, dear. I owe him an apology. Here. You take my arm. Thank you. If you need anything else, any other information, I'll always be glad to help. About yesterday, Lewis. Yesterday, sir. I wasn't very polite. Polite, sir. Don't keep repeating everything I say, Lewis. This new habit of apologising to people's bad enough as it is. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Mm. Anyway, I kicked you out without ceremony after you'd gone to the trouble to bring me that map, and it was it was ungrateful, that's all. Well, sir, gratitude's never been your strong point, has it? Main thing is, you're on the mend. Yes, I am, Lewis. I am. Particularly due to a very interesting case. A case, sir. You're doing it again, Lewis. Yes, Victorian murder. Possibly unsolved. That is, the accused were brought to justice, but were they the real culprits? Well, it's a bit late for a last-minute pardon, isn't it, sir? That's not the point, Lewis. Every case has a solution, whether it's unearthed or not. If it's discovered a century and a half later, well, better than not at all. And can it be discovered? With your help, Lewis. Yours and... I'll pick Mother up about six and drop her. The lady by the next bed. Exactly. Yes. Look... What I want you to do, and what I'd like you to do, I mean, if you've got a few spare moments... Well, we're never very busy down at the station, as you know, sir. The sarcasm is getting the better of you, Lewis. What I would be extremely grateful for is a simple piece of double-checking, hmm? On the court registers of the Oxford Assizes for 1859. I'll give you a quick outline of the case. Now then, Colonel... Part four. A pronounced sentence. Interesting. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, it's the Colonel's book, previous occupant of this bed. Oh, yes. Lovely old man. Yeah. Was he? Always polite. A real gentleman. That's what women appreciate, is it? That's what I'd appreciate. My chap, he... Why? Nothing. Here, the tablets. Oh, yeah. Well, he's a bit older than me. In fact, it was his 40th birthday yesterday. Mm. We had a party. Sounds like fun. <laughs> Should have been. Except he got involved in a fight over me. Said I was flirting. And were you? Not really. It's just he's so possessive. If only I could meet someone civilised. What's your idea of civility? <laughs> I don't know. A candlelit meal? Intelligent conversation? Oh, well, I'll bear that in mind. <laughs> I didn't mean... A little that. Greek restaurant I know in North Oxford. Of course, if I had to exchange blows with your fellow first, I'd probably come off uh, the loser. Well, I could look after you, couldn't I? <laughs> You've got half an hour till lights out. I'd better leave you with your book. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Well, things are looking up. <clears throat> A pronounced sentence. Hmm? Oh, oh, yes. <sighs> yes. After an absence of three quarters of an hour, the jury returned to the court, which waited with breathless anxiety for their verdict. And how do you find the accused? We are unanimous in finding both Mr. Oldfield and Musson guilty, my lord. Yeah! The black coif 
emblematic of death, was placed on the judge's head, and he proceeded to pass sentence. Uh, Jack Oldfield and Alfred Musson, you have been found guilty of the most foul crime of murder. Look not for pardon in this world. You shall be taken whence you came, and from thence to a place of execution. After the trial was over, the two men persisted in maintaining their innocence, but to no avail. Oldfield and Musson were duly hanged in public at Oxford, where, according to newspaper reports, as many as 10,000 people witnessed the macabre spectacle. It was later disclosed, though it had not been observable at the time, that Oldfield's last action in life was to hand the chaplain a postcard to be delivered to his wife, in which, to the very end, he proclaimed his ignorance of the crime for which he had now paid the ultimate penalty. Lights out. Lights out, everyone, please. <sighs> Note of compassion at the end there, Colonel. Up to you now, Morse. Have you tried County Hall? That was my first stop. Oh, in that case, your best bet would be the city archivists. <laughs> but they sent me here. Did they? Well, they should have known that the Central Library has never held court documents. And if the court itself can't help you... Not until Monday, by which time I shall be back on duty again. Oh, in that case... Hello, Sergeant. We can't go on meeting like this. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Greenaway. You seem to be having problems. Well, I'm probably not used to researching, that's all. Oh, it's not much easier when you are, believe me. Patience is the clue. <laughs> What's your task for the chief this time? <sighs> Copies of the Oxford Journal for 1859. I think he imagined we'd have them to hand in the Bodleian. That's him. Always assuming that everyone else has an easy time of it. Mm. Do you like him, though, don't you? The chief? He's the best in the business. Is he? That I've worked for, anyway. Not everyone gets on with him, you know, but... Why? Well, he's a bit of a loner. Most of his pleasures are solitary. Detective work, drinking, books, listening to music. Mm. Which is why this stay in hospital hit him hard, I think. At least to start with. You must get to an age when you wonder whether you've lived your life the right way. Um, you could say that about most ages, though, couldn't you? Will you be going in tonight to the hospital? I suppose so, if I find anything useful, mm. which seems very doubtful at the moment. Thanks for your help. Oh, yeah. Actually, there is a final thought. You could try St Old Eight's police station. They housed quite a lot of records and things during the war, although they can't be all that helpful to the public, of course. <laughs> seems like you're in luck after all, Sergeant. There you are, sir. It's all yours. Or at least I wish it was. And how long have you been chucking stuff in here? It's a kind of storeroom. Legal relics and mementos. In short, anything no one else wants. And how far does it go back? The Cain and Abel case, at least. We're supposed to put it in order, but then people keep asking us to fight crime as well. Sure, I don't know. I was expecting a few piles of documents, not something that looks like the aftermath of a warehouse explosion. <laughs> Sorry about that, sir. Actually, I'm on my lunch break at the moment. There, yes, off you go, Constable. I'll have a wade through on my own. You see, I told you she was worth her weight in gold. You don't get to be top dog at the Bodleian for nothing. Dad! Now, if she was as good at finding a husband as she's at digging out facts... Dad, now, that's enough. <laughs> you sound as though you're trying to sell me to Mr Morse. Oh, well, well, it's the information, really. Though. Excuse me if I'm out of order. You two chat between yourselves. Uh, yes, sir, there'll be something on the radio. Oh, dear. I shall have to make it up to him now just that he can be a bit of a trial sometimes. He's proud of me as a career woman, but he wants me to be someone's housewife as well. Anyone in particular? I don't think he's fussy. Oh, no. uh, look, um, let me run through the notes with you quickly. It's probably best if I sit on the bed. Do you mind? My pleasure. <clears throat> well, um... Uh, this is from the uh, three issues of the Oxford Journal. Mm -hmm. They gave fairly full reports of the trial, and the law reporter seemed to be pretty much on the ball. Now, for instance, he picked up the point about the absence of alcohol in Joanna's body, despite the pub landlord saying that he thought she'd taken a drink. Yes, I've been wondering about that. 
And then there was the, well, the sexual side of things. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently there was some evidence about the captain, Oldfield, paying the boy Wooden to leg the boat through the tunnels. Uh, legging means lying on your back and pushing against the roof of the tunnel. Uh -huh. Well, of course, Musson would have had to lead the horse round, which meant that Oldfield was left on his own with Joanna in the dark. The village of rank, mm. hardly conducive to harmony on board. You don't think Joanna Franks was an entirely innocent victim, do you? If she stayed on board in the dark when she could have walked round... She'd paid to be on board. Women aren't all asking for it, you know, Mr Morse. Well, of course not. I didn't mean to suggest that they but were. You, you may be right. Look, reading through the report, you build up a sort of picture. Go on. I don't know exactly. It, it's as if the bargees weren't quite sure what had hit them from the first. They were keen enough to get their hands on Joanna. They were men, after all. Now who's generalising? <laughs> all right. It's as if she were one step ahead of them all the time. And in the end, she paid for it with her life. Well, that's a very thoughtful analysis. Hmm. Should have had a woman on the case from the word go. <laughs> but if she was one step ahead of them, what was it she was after? What was it she wanted from them? If you're asking me to empathise with a Victorian nymphomaniac... Well, not altogether. I'm afraid I have run out of ideas. <clears throat> now, I think I'd better make it up to my father. Look, um, thanks for all this. It really is a great help. I mean, if I could make it up to you when I get out of here, uh, perhaps meal? Meal or something? I know a Greek place up in North Oxford. Um, I'll give you a ring. Dad? Dad, turn that thing down. Sir? Lewis, where did you spring from? Well, I was uh, waiting till you finished. <sighs> you seem to be having a fairly informal chat. Helping me with my inquiries, that's all. Oh, I see, sir. That young nurse, Fiona, was watching you as well. Seemed a bit put out. Not playing the field, are you? What a ridiculous expression, Lewis. Just that being an invalid seems to have done something for my sexual attraction, that's all. Ah. I thought it was normally the libido. I'll use the Latin word, Sergeant. Thank you. What have you got there? Ah. I wonder when you'd ask, sir. Well, I have. What is it? Ah. A little find I made this afternoon. Had the devil of a job signing it out from St. All Dates. It's a travelling box. What? Victorian. Initials JD engraved on the lid. Which I think might be J for Joanna and D for, um... Donovan. Mm hmm her previous surname. It is, isn't it? Hmm. Seems to be, sir. Because if we open the box up... A woman. What I need is a woman. Not any woman, either. <laughs> In the absence of which... I wonder... Just a measure gone. Well, one more wouldn't hurt, would it? Not this time. <coughs> Nearly there. A step away. Connection to be made. There. Now. Shoes. Underwear. Joanna Franks. The petite and attractive figure. Mr. Morse, oh. what exactly are you doing? I, I was ju uh, just... Is um, that an alcoholic drink you're holding? What, this? <laughs> you will bring about your own ruin. Bells, if I'm not mistaken. No? Yes. <laughs> it's quite impressive. I prefer a single malt myself, but still... I mean, well, do help yourself. Uh, mm. While I'm on duty, Mr. Morse. Ah, uh, no, no, <laughs> of course. And you, given that you'll be leaving us shortly, may choose your own fate here. Oh, thank you. Oh, actually, sister, before you go... Mm -hmm. uh, you might be able to help me. Help you how? I was wondering, what size shoes do you take? I beg your pardon. Because I can't help noticing that you're... Slightly built. I mean, I mean, you're small boned. That is, um. Petite. Exactly, yeah. And what I need to know is what size shoes does a petite woman take? 
But if it's any business of yours, size three. Size three? Hmm. Well, it doesn't help much, does it? Because I don't know what size. Um... Uh, look, sister, next to the bed there, see that box? Yes. Now, if you open it carefully, it's something of an antique. Mr. Morse, what are you playing at? Just a few moments of your time, please. <sighs> right there now. I look inside. This is a lady's undergarment. Shh, shh, shh. It's a torn lady's undergarment, what is more, but underneath... Well, what are these? Shoes. Rather shriveled, I'm afraid. Have to mm. take that into account. But if you, if you could try them on... Mr. Morse, there's something very strange about your mind. Quite aware of that. I just hope it's intelligence. Please, just put your feet up against them, if you prefer. That's all I need to see. Very well. There. Ah. <laughs> well, what does that prove? That I'm not Cinderella? Well, you're not one of the ugly sisters, either. Oh, thank you. What are they, do you think, size? Four, five? Mm, five, ah. possibly. Yes. Well, if you've quite finished with me... Everything I need to know. Hmm. It all begins to fit together. Good night, Mr. Morse. I shall leave you to your perdition. Yes. Yes. Darkness into light. It's like emerging from a canal tunnel. Though not at night. No. Because it happened at night, didn't it? Sometime after midnight. Sometime in the early hours. <laughs> Miss? <laughs> Miss, you're right. No. Where are you going? I, I shall leave this boat and I shall not return. I will walk the foot. Oh, so it'd be all the way to Oxford. Yeah, miss, mind the jump. Oh, miss! <laughs> and was he already there? Did she have to wait? Or walk a little way, perhaps? Mm. Yes, of course. To a clearing through the trees. Are you there? Is that you? Frank? Here. Oh. oh, how are you? How have you been? I've thought about you. I've been wanting you so... No. We have business. Did you? Have you? Is everything ready? It is, yeah, over there in the wagon. And is she... Yes. I have brought the knife. Here. Good. Well, it's sharp enough. I'd rather you did it, though. I don't really want to see her. There's no need. The boat will be slowed at Shuttleworth Lock. Walking fast, you would be ahead of it. There's a place further on called Duke's Cut. Oh. Don't look. If you don't want to see her, don't look. I can't help it. Who is she? Oh, Lord knows. She was travelling alone. Left the coach at Banbury. That's where I heard the wagon. There. There. That should do it. Her face... I will have to see her face. Oh, it's... It's gone black. Well, it's from the water and the frozen. All to our good. But we must hurry and have her discovered quickly. What, what's the state on the boat? Oh, the men are sleeping. I... I made sure of that. Damn them! They'll be damned all right, don't you worry. And the boy cannot leave the tiller, so... Yes, the shoes, then. Will we have time to get them on board? We must... The window of my cabin is open, so as the boat slows towards the lock... Yes, yes. I'll do it. And you must disappear now. You must disappear for good. You are no longer Joanna Franks. She is. But one kiss first. It'll be the last for some while. No. Oh. Well, it's goodbye then. Looks like it. There'll be someone else in the bed tomorrow. Tomorrow? By lunchtime, probably, which is why I have to get it made. Yes, of course. How are things at home? Oh, his thick lips gone down. I think his pride hurts more than anything. Look, about the Greek meal. I think that was a little fantasy, wasn't it? Well, not entirely. I'm not really the sort of woman you'd want to take to dinner, am I? Well, why not? You're... <laughs> Whatever I am, I'm not a librarian in the Bodley. I think she'd be much more your type. Goodbye, Mr. Morse. But... Goodbye. Oh, Lewis, Lewis, Lewis. Yes, sir? No, 
nothing. Ah. So how does it feel to be out in the great wide world then, sir? Anticlimactic. Oh, I forgot to say goodbye to Waggy Greenaway. Must have been watching EastEnders. Is it on in the morning? Mm, don't think so, sir. Still, there's always his daughter, isn't there? Take the leer out of your voice, Lewis. Home, I take it, sir, is it? Well, I'm not going into the station. I've been signed off for a fortnight. Plenty of time to relax, then. Is it the ring cycle takes that long to listen to? Not quite, but you're learning, Lewis. I've got a little more to do than relax, though, and so have you. Mm, that's true, sir. I've got to work. Yes, but there's one more thing you can do for me. Mm, thought there might be some else, sir. What is it? Quite simple, really. I want to know the procedure in the Irish Republic for the exhumation of corpses. For what? You see, Lewis, the Joanna Franks case is one of the most beautiful little deceptions we've ever come across. Not to mention one of the most blatant miscarriages of justice. Sir, are you allowed coffee? Make it weak and pay attention. Sorry, sir. Uh, beautiful deception, miscarriage of justice. The problems inherent in the case, almost all of them, are resolved immediately if we take a small step into imaginative probability. Yes, sir. Um, you've just lost me. Look, a court today would never have found those two men guilty on such slim evidence, agreed? Hmm. We'd certainly never have got a result on it. A bit on the circumstantial side. A bit. When you analyse the prosecution case, it boils down to one thing. Everything hinges on the identification of the body, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And even there, the face is probably barely recognisable. The fact that a pair of shoes fit the corpse. Yeah, but and the birthmark behind the ear, sir. Don't forget that. The husband specifically mm. said... Yeah, all right, all right. We'll come to that in a minute. question is that if the body wasn't Joanna's, if it was a woman killed at some point earlier... Sir? Killed by forcible drowning, certainly. Probably in a horse trough. Yes, a horse trough. Somewhere near the coach stop in Banbury. Because if you remember, Joanna Franks was inquiring about coaches which arrived in Banbury. But killed by who, sir? Well, by an ostler, of course. He'd have every excuse to be hanging around a horse trough, wouldn't he? Plus, he'd have been able to identify the most appropriate passenger. I mean, some poor girl travelling on her own, not likely to be missed. Even if she was, no computer networks, no nationwide broadcasts in those days. Sir, I'm really not... Listen, with you. listen. He has the body in a cart. Mm -hmm. He rendezvous with Joanna. Yeah. Slices the undergarment to make it look as though his victim was raped. No semen test in those days either, Lewis. And then... Then the shoes, the victim's shoes, quietly slipped aboard. Of course, they fitted her perfectly. Although I'm pretty sure they'd have been too big for Joanna Franks. And then, finally, a short time later, the unfortunate girl herself... Well, what, sir? ...dumped unceremoniously in the canal. Whoever she was, she was now Joanna Franks. The dead Joanna Franks. If I'm with you, sir, it's rather terrible to think of, isn't it? Yes, yeah, dreadful. One murder unsolved and two men wrongly hanged for another which never took place. No, Joanna Franks was not the victim. If I'm right, she was the mastermind. Yeah, but wait a minute, sir. You're saying that the man who helped her was her husband, Charles Franks, the ostler, because he'd examined the girl he'd murdered, mm -hmm. noted she had a birthmark and could bring it up in court. Right. What I don't see is the motive for the whole thing. Money. But what money? I know that they were poor. Well, perhaps not so poor. But they'd hit on a system. They wanted to try it again. No, her helper wasn't Charles Franks. Or, not exactly, though I've no doubt he adopted the part so well he paid it unconsciously. Now, you remember the map you brought me, Lewis? The one, the one I was less than grateful for? Yes, sir. Well, look. I think the final proof lies here. In Burtner Boy Bay. You're not related to Kipling's Mulvaney by any chance, are you, Inspector? Uh, no, sir, but it's a good question. <laughs> I can see you're a man of education. My family are all of the Mulvaneys of Cork, as far back as they go. And father and son in the Garda, though I'm the first to be out of the uniform. Well, it's very good of you to help. Oh, not at all. It's not every day we get to join in an investigation with the British police. <laughs> and particularly not in this neck of the woods. Well, it is unofficial, I should say. Unofficial? Hmm. Oh. Well, in that case, uh, we're off duty. <laughs> Here. Have a drop. Oh, thanks. Uh, very kind of you. Oh, Oh, God, it's powerful stuff. Ah, uh, well, it keeps the damp out of your bones. Oh. So, uh, how long will you be in Ireland now? Oh, a few days, touring around a little. Touring around with the porpoise, I'd say. Mm -hmm. uh, hmm. 
Uh, the cemetery is beyond that hedge. Ah, that's one of the finest views on the coast if the residents could only appreciate it. <laughs> How did you swing it? Digging up a grave? Ah, who's the bother? No one comes out here anymore. After all, we're only taking a peep inside, aren't we? That's the idea. <laughs> Mind the brambles now. Ah, looks like they're nearly done. And who is this F.T. Donovan we're paying a visit to? Then? Emperor of all the illusionists, is how he described himself. Uh, did he know? How's it going, boys? Uh, there's wood, sir. Ah, so it is. Ah, and beautifully preserved, wouldn't you say, Inspector? Mm. Ah, it's the peat in the soil, does it? So the body inside should be... Uh, Fresh as a daisy. <laughs> like it's not here. Sit up and shake hands with us. <laughs> uh, now then, uh, who's to leave at the lid? Uh, the rent share, sir. Uh, away you go then. Uh, brace up first, Inspector. Uh, yes, I do. Oh, thanks. Oh, oh, holy the shit. Well, now, what do you make of that? Perfect condition, sir. So it is. I might take it for the front room. I'm not so sure about the colour, though. Uh, what do you say, Inspector? Emperor of all the illusionists. Uh, called and well called. Any man who can change himself into a roll of carpet after death. Oh, hello. Uh, just wait a minute, right? Ah, I wondered whether you'd ring. Well, there was one more task you gave me. <laughs> you made me sound like a slave driver. And aren't you? <laughs> I was happy to do it. The insurance tables. Yes. Did you... Oh, they took some finding, tucked away in the stacks, but here we are. This one's for 1859. The premiums are graduated, of course. By age next birthday. Why, she'd have been 39. Though I suppose they'd have taken out a policy a year or two earlier. Wouldn't have made much difference. Inflation doesn't seem to have been rampant. Let's see. Three pounds, eight shillings. Three pounds, eight shillings a year. So if they'd had a policy for two years, that would have been a net cost of under seven pounds. The payout on death? A hundred. Yeah. It's not a bad investment, is it? A hundred pounds would go a long way in those days. And if it wasn't the first they'd pocketed... How do you mean? Little discovery I made in Ireland. Look, I could fill you in on the whole thing over dinner. Remember the Greek restaurant I mentioned? Bring my holiday snaps along. Well, actually... Oh, right, fair enough. I'll leave the holiday snaps at home. No, it's not that. It's, um... The thing is, there's someone here. Ah. A man. Yes. Sorry. Hmm. I couldn't say anything in hospital. My father's rather old-fashioned about living in sin. I see. How oh, is your father, by the way? Oh, fine. Coming out Thursday. Hmm. I enjoyed working together. If that's what we did. Yes. I think that's what we did. And I enjoyed your company. I... I uh, have to go. I'll think about you from time to time. <laughs> Thanks. I'll do the same. <sighs> the libido or the attraction... Hmm. Who knows? Still, I got something out of being in hospital. Thank you, Colonel. Thank you profoundly. A hundred pounds clear of tax. If they made the same on Donovan's death, might have lasted them a lifetime. Lewis! Yes, sir. Well, sir? What about welcome home, Inspector? Oh, yes. Welcome, uh, welcome home, sir. Thank you. But uh, was he there? He was not. But I was right. 
What, the insurance, Fiddle? Well, Joanna's father was in the business, wasn't he? She must have seen the possibilities early. And after Donovan's faked death went so smoothly and the company paid out... They decided to try it again. Only this time they insured her. Donovan reincarnated himself as Charles Franks from Liverpool. Are you certain of that, sir? Certain as a roll of carpet in a coffin. No, more than that. Listen, do you remember on the evidence there was a man who passed along the canal bank that night, a man whose description matched that of one Donald Favant, who never came forward? Yes, sir. Well, what is Don Favant almost an anagram of? An anagram? F.T. Donovan. Yeah, the man couldn't bear to relinquish his real name entirely, no matter what alias he took up, whether he was Hefty Donovan, like, like a waggy greenaway, or Charles Franks, when he turned his real Christian name into a surname. F.T. Donovan Don Favon. Yeah, it doesn't quite use all the letters, though. Well, the man was committing murder, not setting a crossword clue. But like so many criminals who use a false identity, he needed to hang on to his real self in some respect. So, Donald Favon, or F.T. Donovan, stayed the night in Oxford after the murder, and then... And then metamorphosed back into Charles Franks, the grieving widower for the trial. After which, the insurance paid out on Joanna's death, they met up again, and lived happily ever after. In the name of... I wonder. Yeah, it may not have been happily ever after, though, may it? Thieves and murderers do have a habit of falling out, sir. Mr and Mrs Todd Van Naff? <laughs> no, well, perhaps not. It's amazing. And frustrating, given there's nothing we can do about it. Though I am writing to the Colonel's widow, short note of condolence and gratitude. Mm, you won't tell her he got it all wrong. Uh, what's the point? Anyway, I think somehow he knows that. Somehow he's watching us. And you an atheist, sir. Oh, for goodness sake, if this is convalescence. Shall I get it, sir? Take a message. Yeah, would you, Lewis? Now then, let's see. Hello? Yes? Uh, no, I'm afraid he's not. He's back soon. But, uh, who's speaking, please? Oh. Oh, yes, I think we met. Hmm? Yes? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. Right, well, I'm, uh, I'm, well, I'll, I'll pass that on and I'm sure I'll get back to you. Yes, yes, goodbye. And who was that? Well, you'll never guess, sir. No, I won't, Lewis, so tell me. Sister McLean from the hospital. She got your number from the files. Not being recalled for a service, am I? No, not quite, sir. She's off duty. Apparently, she wondered if you fancied a drink. She wondered? Hmm, didn't sound so bad out of uniform. Quite feminine, really. Said she wasn't one of the ugly sisters. <laughs> Is that a private joke? <laughs> she leave her number, Lewis? Ah, uh, yes, sir. And her address. Are you going to... Am uh... I going to? Do I ever turn down a drink, Lewis? Well, no, sir. But... Just at this moment, there is nothing I fancy more. Well, very little, anyway. Turn the record player up, will you, Lewis? Yes, sir. I'm off to get changed. I see the feelings on the zoot's a All the rules 